uh, welcome you to uh, Mission Valley Community Chapel. Just want to have a, a moment of uh, silence for prayer. All right, if you would uh, stand with me, and we want to begin our worship this morning in number six. Hymn number six, Come Thou Almighty King, number six. Sweet, sweet, 
have some new folks here uh, that I saw. You have some friends there. Max, you want to introduce her? This is our very dear friend. Very older. I always blame. <laughs> 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 you go by it honestly. Okay, well, welcome here. Karen. Yeah. Karen, welcome to the chapel. Good to see um, the family, too. Mike and Marge. And Lots of them. I, yeah, I saw them in the foyer. I couldn't get around them. They just blocked the door. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, Mike and Sharon McMahon. And uh, we're glad to have you here, Brother Ed and Maxine. We've prayed for you uh, for months now, and your answer to prayer, you're both up and walking. Well, sort of. Well, and Donna, good to, right yeah, well, I didn't go that far. <laughs> Donna, good to see you, too. You, you've been under the weather, too. Okay, any other new folks here or visitors here today we want to say hello to? Well, we'll say hello to y'all anyway. All y'all. Okay. All right. Well, for the uh, announcements, uh, this evening is uh, uh, John Townsend will be at uh, Dan Wheelock's. Uh, his brother uh, Myrna is in rehab. In, in, so she's able to walk, uh, she won't be coming home. At least that's their hope that she'll get strong enough to where she can move under her own power. And uh, that's at 6 o'clock. Monday uh, is craft night, Mayor Hall. Tuesday at 7 o'clock is a prayer meeting, family prayer meeting. And then uh, Sunday, everything will start at Sunday schools. The first Sunday of the month, we'll have communion. Uh, during the preaching service, during the 11 o'clock hour. I want to pray for our government and those in authority, federal, state, local, that they would uh, seek the Lord for the decisions that they have to make that will concern all of us. Also for the persecuted brethren in the world, um, still some in uh, Afghanistan and, and others, uh, that are on the news. We pray for Ukraine, uh, things that are going on there, and uh, ask the Lord to intervene. The Lord can, and He does, raise up kings and kingdoms. He also takes them down. So let's trust the Lord that His will will be done in that regard. Uh, there's others on the list here that uh, you can pray for. Uh, put it in your Bible and pray during the week. And also, we want to remember the broadcasts that go out, uh, Sobrods and Tom's broadcast through the radio waves, uh, CEF teachers, and uh, the fair. We've decided that the fair board has decided to have a fair, so we're gearing up for that. Appreciate your prayer and help in that regard. Real Life Ministries, the dental band in uh, Mexico, and the White Fields National of Pastors. So let's remember uh, these requests. Now today is very day. Where is Haley? Oh, she's hiding. <laughs> Haley, this very day is her tenth birthday. Stand up, Haley. Come on. <laughs>
you would uh, stand with me and turn in your hymn books to number 797, Jesus Saves, 797. also think of the um, uh, the many ministries that are shed abroad through through the, this chapel and, and the many missionaries that we support. Lord, we just ask that you would strengthen each and every one spiritually, Lord, physically, and may financially you take care of each and every need. So, Lord, we just, just ask that today as you bless us with your presence, bless us with the presence of each other, and bless us with our, our dear brother Ed, that, Lord, your word, your word would just uh, sink deep into each and every heart here. So, Lord, we do. Thank you. Thank you for saving. We thank you for being here. And just thank you for this day. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You may be seated. And now we'll have us. Uh, uh, Ken, yep. I have a vision, but it has to be confirmed by Betsy. <laughs> Los Angeles, 6th Street, a whole apartment building, the top of it, Jesus saves. And I believe it's a, the whole apartment building was Biola 
and McGee was the pastor. Is that right? Look at that vision. Historical perspective on Jesus saves. Thank you. Ken, it is so wonderful to be with you again today. Uh, just a couple of quick updates. Uh, thank you for praying for uh, my wife and my health. We had quite an adventure last summer when we were out and we'd been with you and then went uh, up to Bakersfield to visit our son. Uh, my wife didn't know that she had COVID and uh, neither did I. Uh, and uh, she had a fall, uh, she had a heart issue, apparently, the doctor said, and lost consciousness and fell in the uh, uh, bathroom in the hotel where we were staying and heard a loud crash at 2.15, woke up, called her name and didn't get a response, shoveled in there as quickly as I could and she was uh, completely unconscious uh, for about 40 more seconds and then came to, we got the, the hospital manager and I, rather the hotel manager and I got uh, the EMTs on the phone, they took her in uh, to the hospital and she had broken her back in the fall. Uh, so um, because of, uh, we had to recuperate from COVID for the next uh, 10 days or so and um, I'm grateful that my son and his family came up and, and uh, helped us with that so much. And then uh, we, uh, uh, my other son, uh, 
Martin drove us because we couldn't take the, the uh, plane, drove us across uh, uh, the country and she had a turtle shell uh, body armor <laughs> cast uh, that they put her in with a heart monitor and it was quite an adventure, I'll tell you. But uh, uh, we, we got them safely and we're very grateful for your prayers for that. And uh, she's recovered from the heart issue completely um, and, uh, and from the COVID, although we got it once more uh, <laughs> after that. Um, but uh, we're grateful to be here and uh, uh, grateful for your prayers, very much so. Uh, the ministry has gone amazingly well. Right now I'm writing theology for our trainees, our pastors in uh, Central Africa particularly. And uh, this last year they saw over 47,000 trust Christ uh, in the training uh, through the uh, through the trainees and that brings uh, a total of uh, over 121,000 who have become Christians uh, in the through the training over uh, since 2008 but today I'd like us to turn to the gospel of Mark the gospel of Mark And chapter 1, we're looking at the very first chapter. Mark gives the theme of his gospel in the very first verse. The theme of his gospel is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The way, in fact, I'd like you to, uh, to rehearse that phrase with me because we're going to use it a couple of times in the reading. Okay, say it with me. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That was good, but it could have been better. Let's try it again. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Beautiful, beautiful. That's the theme of Mark, and the way that Mark is going to present Jesus the Messiah, God's Son, is as the perfect servant. In the Old Testament, if you remember Isaiah chapter 42, God says, Behold my servant, and then he describes who the Messiah will be like. Again, in chapter 49, all of chapter 49 is about the servant, the Messiah. Again, in chapter 50, uh, verse 4, and the verses following, it's about the servant, the servant of the Lord and the suffering that he will go through. And then at the end of chapter 52, verse 13, and all through chapter 53, it is about the suffering servant and why he suffered, namely as an atonement, a blood atonement for you and for me. And so it's very important to understand why he presents him as the servant. He is the servant of the Lord, Ebed Yahweh. He is, he is a God's servant, but he's also the Son of God. Now let's look at uh, chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let's say that together. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, verse 2. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. So in verse 1, he says he's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he, verse uh, 2 and 3, he says that uh, we're preparing the way of the Lord. So he's not only the Son of God, but he's the Lord. That's why John the Baptist was going uh, to, pre, uh, to prepare his way. You can share that one with your Jehovah's Witness friends, by the way. In verse 4, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed would bapt, uh, baptized you with water, 
but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Why can he baptize with the Holy Spirit? Because he is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Get it? Verse 9. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Why did he say that? Because he is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You're getting it. Okay, verse 12. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered to him. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, and believe the good news. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Why did they follow him? Because he is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Right. They, and then when he had gone a little further, verse 19 from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Why did they leave their father? Because he is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then they went, uh, then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught, verse 21. Uh, Luke adds, he was teaching them on the Sabbaths. So this was a continual practice. Verse 22. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Why could he teach with authority? Because he is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Right. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Why did he come out of it? Because Jesus was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Now how would that happen on a Sabbath day? Because you could only go three quarters of a mile under Jewish law on the Sabbath day. And so, but if you could look at it from a bird's eye view, you would see this person leaving the synagogue for three quarters of a mile talking to everybody. You could, this person doing the same thing. And like a bee, a beehive, or like an ant uh, colony, you would see them just buzzing everywhere, spreading the news to every place around Galilee. And so it spread all over. Verse 29. Now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever. She had COVID or something like it. And they told him about her at once. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Luke adds, and they made request of him concerning her, and he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately, Mark adds, the fever left her, and she served them. Mark's looking at service again. Verse 32. At evening, you remember, 
They've already gone all over Galilee sharing this word, right? Right in that afternoon, it all happened. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. How many lived in Capernaum at that time? 1,500 about. About 1,500. And so they are all, the whole 1,500 of them are right there. They're either, they're bringing their neighbors, and remember, in those days there were no hospitals. Hospitals came uh, 100 or 200 years later as Christians began to obey what Jesus said. But, but here there are no hospitals. So if you uh, broke your leg, guess what? They would try to set it, but it probably would never heal correctly. If you broke your arm, same thing. If you had illnesses, same thing. So you had hundreds and thousands of uh, people who were lame and people who were sick who could not get medical attention, who could not be healed any other way. It's not like here now. Everybody in every household had somebody who was in such a situation. And so they were all bringing these people because they had seen Jesus heal. Luke says he was already involved in healing around the area. They had already seen some of his works. And they would seen what he had done in the synagogue that day and what authority he had. So they're coming and bringing their demon-possessed people who were, uh, that was very prevalent in their time. It's becoming more prevalent in our time. The whole city is gathered at the door. What does Jesus do? Verse 34. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases. Luke adds, Dr. Luke, we should add, and he, he laid his hands on every one of them, and he healed them. Nobody was left out. Not like uh, our uh, miracle campaigns now. Uh, but everybody got healed. And so... Uh, he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they all knew him. Verse 35. Now in the morning, what would you do if you would had a day like Jesus had had the day before? You'd probably want to sleep in, right? Not Jesus. Verse 35. Now in the morning having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place or a desert place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And when they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also. Because for this purpose I have come forth. Probably during that time with his father, the father reminded him of Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 1, which said that the great light which came to those who were in the darkness in the valley of the shadow of death, that great light would go throughout the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. And Jesus knew that it wasn't just for those towns around the lake, it was for that entire great province just west of the lake. So he had to go to all of those cities and minister there as well. In verse 39, he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. May the Lord add his blessing to his word. Now today, <clears throat> we're not going to have so much of a sermon, as it were, but more like a Bible study. I'm so glad that you're having that new Bible study, and I'm going to be praying with you that, that God blesses it. And in a Bible study, when you want to know what the Bible says, you ask questions of the text. Who wrote it? Why did they write it? What was the theme? You're going after questions. And then the text will answer those questions, and you will get new biblical information. So here's question number one for this passage that we just read. Looking at the account of Jesus going by the Sea of Galilee in 1, 16 through 20, we ask, was this the first time that Peter, James, John, was this the first time 
that they had met Jesus. What do you think? Anybody? Is this the first time? No. Okay, we got to no. know. How many of you vote yes? They think this was the first time. We got a yes. Okay, anybody else? We got two yeses. All right. Sound like an auctioneer here. All right. Okay, here's what really happened. I'm afraid that the no's have it. They knew Jesus. They knew him very well. In fact, they were already disciples of Jesus. For how long had they been disciples of Jesus? They had been disciples of Jesus for roughly one year. You see, all the first four chapters of John had already been finished before this incident. They had been his followers for that entire time. Maybe 10 months, maybe 13 months, we're not quite sure, but roughly one year. You say, well, why do Matthew, Mark, and Luke start here? Why didn't they write about the events of John 1 and John 4? The short, answer, the short answer is because they weren't there. Not a one of them. John 1 through 4 was phase 1. This incident begins phase 2 of Jesus' ministry. Matthew was called in phase 2. He wasn't even around in phase 1. Mark was just a kid. He's later going to write, Eusebius tells us, Peter's commentary on Matthew's gospel. Remember, Matthew wrote a gospel in Hebrew at the beginning. Then later he wrote a gospel, the same gospel in Greek. And at the very least, Peter is commenting on Matthew's first gospel through his progeny, Mark. Luke undoubtedly used that first Matthew's Gospel, but with many other eyewitnesses' source contributing, he says. But John was with Jesus that very first day, just to remind you. Here's John the Baptist. He sees Jesus coming by after the temptation is, is done. Jesus walks by him there by the lake, and John says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then again, the next day, the same thing happens. Jesus walks by, and John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. Who's standing by him? John's on one side. Andrew's on the other. They were disciples of John the Baptist. And so they start walking behind Jesus. And he turns around and says, Hey, fellas, what are you looking for? You know, if two people are walking behind you for a long time, you want to know what they're thinking, right? And so he asked them, what are you looking for? They said, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he says, come and see. And so they came and saw him. And they were with him where he was staying. He was probably camping out. Remember, he said, the foxes have holes and the birds of the, uh, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of God does not have lay, wherewith to lay his head. And there they were with him at the campsite. And they're finding him out to be the most magnetic personality in the world. The same phenomena is happening with their hearts that happened with the two disciples later on the Emmaus Road as they were walking with the risen Lord Jesus. And they said, did not our hearts burn within us when he opened to us the scriptures? And here are Andrew and John entering into the fellowship of the burning heart. Are you in that fellowship? And they were learning who Jesus was. He was the most magnetic personality the world had ever seen. They were thinking the same things the temple guards would later say when they said, never did any man speak like this man speaks. And Andrew and John are so stoked by this time that Andrew has to tell him, excuse me, Lord, I have to go somewhere. Would you please not say anything important until I get back? <laughs> and he goes and finds his brother Peter, and he says, we found the Messiah. Come on. Peter says, really? Yeah. So Peter goes with him. And as Peter's walking up to him, uh, only remember his name is Simon at this point. And Jesus says to him, you are Shimon bar -Yona. He said, I know who you are. He said, but your name shall be Kephas. By the way, it's not Cephas. It's a hard C. 
It's K in Greek. It's kephas, stone, rock. He never met him before, but now he's renaming him already. The next day, they're joined by Philip and Nathaniel. The day after that, they're at the wedding in Cana where Jesus makes the water into wine. Now, this is important. Just after the Cana miracle, John writes that Jesus and his, uh, took his family and took his disciples and moved everybody where? Into Capernaum. So when he goes to Capernaum in verse 16 and following, he's coming back home. He's going where he's already moved his family and disciples. Now they went with him. Shortly after that, into Jerusalem, they saw him do many miracles. They saw him do some, some great works. And now they're going back to Capernaum. They thought, okay, wasn't that a great time? Go with Jesus. See him heal people. See him do great works. Hear some of his teaching. Wasn't that a wonderful time at the wedding when we saw him change the water into wine? Whew. What a year we've had. That was a great short-term mission trip, wasn't it? What a, a wonderful year. Did you get the photos of that, Peter? Yeah. Did you get the video on that one, John? Yeah. We'll, we'll share it on, on, you know, on Friday night when we get together. It was over, right? It was not over. And that's what this whole incident is about. So here's question two. What does Jesus mean when he says, follow me here? Jesus is saying, no, fellas, it's not over. That was phase one. We're going to go deeper now. If you will, you're coming into full-time Christian ministry. Your short-term work is done. Your year is finished, but it's not finished. You're coming with me. And together, you're going to see me redeem the world, and we're going to change the planet. They didn't know all that then, but they had to step out and follow Jesus. They thought they were coming back home to start right where they left off. They went back to the business as usual. They went back to their fishing companies. They went back to what they used to do every day. Only Jesus is saying, you're not going to be the same person you were before. You're not going to do what you did before. You're coming with me. Now let me ask you a question. We've asked some questions of the text. Let me ask a question of you. How deep is the call of Jesus the Christ on your heart? How deep is the call of Jesus the Christ on your heart. Now I realize, I can tell you the number of people that I've known over the last 53 years who told me they were going into ministry, who told me they were going into missions, who told me about the sincere desire to join up with Jesus. For one reason or another, the dream fizzled. What they thought Jesus wanted them to do, what they thought they wanted to do, it didn't happen. Maybe it was domestic matters. Maybe it was finances. Maybe it was training. Maybe it was just some circumstance. They couldn't do it. But it's always been on the front burner in their hearts. They would never go to a church that didn't have a strong missions program. Missions has always been important to them. They pray for the missionaries. They've always thought of missionaries as those dear people, and I was almost one of them. Somehow they never got there. Now, I want to not hurt you today. I want to encourage you today that regardless of what has happened in the meantime, regardless of why you never quite got there, if Jesus' call is strong on your heart, if he has got you submitted to him, then the outward circumstances don't matter. You're still his missionary, right where you are. 
If he's got your heart, if you're totally submitted to him every day, where you're abiding in him, he's abiding in you, and you're letting him call the shots, you're letting the life of the risen Lord live through you, then he will open doors for you right where you are. And he will allow you to be able to share his good news with the people on your work, with the people in your neighborhood, with people all around you. He will cross your paths with the people who would cross the path of the risen Lord were he in your shoes. And guess what? He is in your shoes. <laughs> he is in your shoes. If you're yielded, he'll do it. You say, well, what about vocationally? I mean, I'm at retirement age now. I've already lived my life. It's certainly too late, isn't it? No, it's not. No, it's not. Not only for that day-to-day -day yieldness to Jesus Christ, but guess what? Now, he's already taught you a whole volume of life experiences. I remember Howard Hendricks saying one of the greatest heartbreaks of his life was to see people who were now at retirement age who had all the wisdom, all the knowledge, all the experience, even all the money in some cases. But that was where their life ended. It stopped right there. Don't let it stop right there. You now have all the experience and all the wisdom, and now all God wants is all the yieldedness. Your second half can be way, way better than your first. I know of many, many people, even at retirement age, who are saying, Lord, what can I do? And they have offered themselves to Jesus Christ. And God has said, yeah, let's go. Let's get together in a great adventure. Our particular mission board is filled with pastors who hit retirement age and said, you know what? I want to be a missionary from here on. And that's what they're doing. God can use you as long as you're available, whenever you are and wherever you are. Peter... James, John, Andrew, we're just going to learn that lesson. Question number three. What did do Jesus do on the Capernaum Shabbat? Number one, he taught with authority, we learn in verse 21 and, and following. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Why? Because Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so he can teach with authority, and they heard it. Second, he cast out demons, and this was brand new. Before, in phase one, wherever they went with Jesus, he did miracles, he did teaching, he taught them how to baptize, he taught them how to make disciples, and they would do that in the Great Commission. You know, He told them, go and make disciples, baptizing them, go do what I showed you in phase one. As they learned all those things, there was one element they didn't get to see. And that was the whole area of the demonic. That wasn't in John 1 through 4 at all. Suddenly, here on Capernaum, phase 2 begins. Satan knows it has begun. And now Jesus begins to dispel the works of darkness. Jesus begins to untie the kingdom of Satan. Jesus begins to knock over the works of darkness, and the enemy knows it. Have you come here to destroy us? They weren't sure. They thought maybe he was going to open up uh, the abyss right then and send them all down. They know he's there to undo their kingdom. And so it starts, and he heals many who were possessed of demons that very night. And then again, he rebukes the fever of, uh, of Peter's wife. And he healed hundreds that evening. Uh, Luke says, as I mentioned, he healed every single one of them. Uh, no one escaped. Uh, Jesus made sure that he completely undid the kingdom of Satan there in Capernaum uh, that day. And that leads us to a next question, question four. Why did he need to pray so early in the morning the next day? After a day like that, why did he need to pray? 
we find the answer, if you'll keep your finger here and go over to Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 4. And there we're told, Messiah is speaking. The Holy Spirit is allowing Isaiah to know what God is going to speak through Messiah 700 years later. And in verse 4 he says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, or the disciple, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned or as the disciple. And that's what Jesus was doing. He was getting, morning by morning, he was getting instruction from the Father. The Father was saying, here's where we're going to go. Here's where we're going to minister. Here's what we're going to do. So he was getting his marching orders from God the Father. The Father, as I mentioned, probably reminded him of Isaiah 9-1 that he was going to have to go to all the cities of the Gentiles, not just the ones around the lake. But not only to receive instructions from the Father, but B, to be filled again with the Father by the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to remember what Paul told us later. He said that right when Jesus took on human nature, human flesh, human form. He says, have this mind in you, which was also in Messiah Jesus, who, though being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be clutched, something to be held on to. But instead, he emptied himself. He made himself nothing. And took on, he said, the form of a servant. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death. So here is Jesus with the Father. And he, what Jesus has done was realizing that he was coming into earth, taking on human nature. He wasn't going to rest upon his divine power any longer while he was here on earth. Instead, he was going to be completely dependent upon the Father, uh, excuse me, upon God the Father through the Holy Spirit. It was the Father's power that worked with him here. And he's teaching us a lesson here, and that is this, that it is the nature of humanity to be dependent upon deity. Jesus was the perfect man. How did he function? He functioned in the power of his Father's deity. In the very same way, you and I as redeemed human beings are never meant to be dependent on our own power. Instead, we are dependent on the power of Christ, just as he was dependent on the power of the Father. Just as Christ is his humanity dependent upon his Father's deity, so we in our humanity are dependent upon the deity of the Lord Jesus. As he now lives his life in you and me, we were never meant to live the Christian life in our own strength. Because frankly, it's impossible. It's not simply, okay, I'm saved and I'm going to do my best for Jesus and I'm going to you know, conquer the world. No, no, that's not going to happen. The only way that you and I can live the Christian life is by humbly, like Jesus here in prayer with the Father, humbly getting with the Lord and saying, Lord Jesus, I can't, but you can. So live your life through me today. Show me what's on your heart for me today. And have my heart, have my mind, have my hands, have my feet, have all that I am, and use me for your glory. That's how the Christian life gets lived. And it takes prayer, daily prayer, just like Jesus was doing, to be filled with Him the same way prayer, daily prayer, was necessary for Jesus to be filled with the Father. Remember what He said in John 14? He said, it's not me. What you're seeing is the Father doing the works through me. 
I always do those things which please my Father. And just as it was the Father with Jesus, so Jesus is with us. He lives and works through us as we depend on Him. So let me ask you, are you depending on Jesus? Were you with Him this morning when you got up? Did you give the day to Him? Did you ask Him to live His life through you? Did you ask Him to fill you with His Spirit the way He would ask His Father to do the same thing? That's the essence, the nutshell of the Christian life. And that's what He wants you to take away from this. I remember what Jim Mater used to say. He said, if prayer was necessary for the Son of God, how much more necessary is it for you and me? And boy, is that true. Jesus had to depend on the Father, and so we pray. You and I have to depend on Jesus, so we pray. It's a daily battle. You see, Jesus isn't done with just phase one or just phase two. Now we're in, ever since Acts chapter two, we're in phase three. We're in the time when Jesus is working in the world, and he works through people like you and me, just like he did with Andrew, with Peter, with John. And he's still subverting the kingdom of darkness every day. But he still needs people like you and me to depend on him in the same way he depended on his father. He still needs people like us to yield ourselves to him for whatever his plans may be. And those could, have, could be way bigger plans than you're thinking right now, if you'll really ask him. So let me ask you again. How deep is the call of Jesus the Christ upon your heart? And let me ask you again, how deep are you depending on him day by day to get that done? Let's pray. Thank you, Father God, for the Lord Jesus. Lord, he's so wonderful. He's so beautiful. And all that he is to us in his sinless glory in his divine perfection. But thank you that, Father, he depended upon you. And thank you that you want us now to depend on him, and that is available. As we make ourselves available, available to him every day, he will live out his life in us and through us. And that includes the great plans that he may have for our lives that we haven't even considered yet. We've never even thought through what you think could be possible through us. And so we make ourselves available today to you for all that you have planned. It may be just day by day reaching the people around us that we already have. It may be bigger than that. It may be to another field in the United States. It could be to a field across the sea. Lord, we leave that to you. Here we are. Take us. Use us. Show us, lead us, whatever your heart has for us. And Lord, we make ourselves available to you to use us day by day to do the things Jesus would do if he were in our shoes. And you are in our shoes, Lord Jesus. You live in us. So fill us, lead us, direct us, bless us. And with every head bowed and eye closed, I don't know everyone here today, but today you may be here and this is all something new to you. You're not sure who this Jesus is. As Mark says, he is Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. He came here to take your sins on himself. He came here to die in your place. He came here to die for your sins. And if you will trust him this very day, that he died for you and that he rose again, to declare himself to be the Son of God, then he will come into your life and he will live his life in you and forgive your sins and start a whole new life. And you can just tell him right now in your heart of hearts, Lord Jesus, I do believe. I trust in you. Come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me of my sins. I believe you rose again. Now live your risen life through me. Here I am, Lord. Lord, look upon each heart and do your will in each life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Brother Ed. If we uh, could stand and we want to close uh, today's uh, service with 819, 819, bringing in the sheaves. And I'm just letting Judy know, so hopefully uh, you know, she can pick that up quick. Like... I'm sure she can.